today's webinar, uh, the outline is shown here. We're going to cover uh, a number of different phenotypic evidence searches in uh, different resources. We'll highlight them in different resources. Um, so, for example, we'll be highlighting um, some phenotypic searches in fungi DB, uh, some subcellular localization and tagging uh, experiments in, uh, in TriTrip DB and Giardia DB, uh, whole genome mutagenesis in, um, in this is in Plasmo DB. There's also another whole, whole genome. Uh, mutagenesis uh, CRISPR experiment and also a hyperlophit um, uh, subcellular localization uh, experiment that will be demoed in, in ToxoDB. Uh, one thing, obviously, if you work on a database that we're not presenting today, uh, don't worry. Obviously, if there is data out there for your organism of interest, we would love to hear about that data because then we can, we can load it and make it available through the resources. So if you are aware of a um, a whole genome mutagenesis for Giardia or for uh, a microsporidium species or for another fun fungal organism, um, or if you know of uh, uh, some sort of whole genome um, uh, uh, screens in uh, vectors, obviously, that would be great to hear about those if they exist. And uh, we will uh, work on incorporating them. And then the, the same types of searches that we will demo today will become um, available to you. So today presenting will be uh, Evelina Bashenko, who's based at the University of Liverpool. I will be presenting a little bit as well, uh, and I'm based at the University of Pennsylvania, Omar Harb, and uh, Suzanne Warrenfels from the University of Georgia uh, will also be presenting um, some of the, the different types of searches. So we're going to be uh, toggling back and forth between our different um, locations. So with that, I think we will go ahead and uh, get started. Um, Eve, I'm going to make you the presenter. and. Uh, We'll let you take it away. All right. Thanks very much, Amar. Let's see. Um, now you should be seeing my screen. And before we start, I just wanted to mention that uh, if anyone is interested in receiving a uh, certificate for attending today's webinar, we will be sending out an email after the webinar, uh, and that email will include a few links. Uh, to the survey as well as um, the certificate that you can print out. All right, um, so today I will uh, demo several search strategies in FindGDB using the integrated phenotypic data. And we will start first by looking at the uh, phenotypic evidence mapped to one species, such as Neurospora crassa and then um, learn how to transform these results into another closely related species, such as Neurospora discreta. So let's go ahead and navigate to the phenotypic search um, and click on phenotype evidence to bring up essentially a list of currently available data sets at your disposal that you can mine for, um, for information in various species. In the search, I will use uh, Neurospora crassa uh, genome project phenotype collection. It's essentially a large phenotype collection where researchers have uh, looked at the knockout strains and characterized the phenotypes associated with these mutations. So in this particular search, I'm interested in looking at specific morphology, and I am using uh, criteria on the left essentially to uh, specify and navigate the uh, data set metadata. And I will look for abnormal area hyphae and also abnormal conidiation when um, Neurospora crassa is grown on slants. So notice that there is 101 and 93 genes are annotated for each, um, for each category. And when I click Get Answer, the page will um, refresh and essentially show you uh, a list of genes that match the very specific uh, search criteria that we have just um, uh, set up. And while the page um, refreshes, here we are. Um, here we are. We have a list of 55 genes that essentially, if you forgot what uh, criteria you have um, selected, you can click on the button Edit, and it tells you that we are looking for anything that has an abnormal area hyphae and also abnormal candidiation. So this particular list of genes um, can be explored further. You can also download data by clicking on the Download button, and you can navigate to a particular um, 
genes or and uh, their gene record pages by clicking on the link within the gene ID column. Here, for example, I have one uh, gene ID already opened up and I navigate it to the phenotypic section associated with this gene using the menu on the left. And um, I am on the Neurospora Genome Project Phenotype Image Collection data for this particular gene. Um, notice that you have a uh, table that contains information about the temperature, um, how cells were grown, how the images were taken, and also characteristics of three um, uh, different phenotypes for morphology, physiology, and sexual development when available. If you're interested in visualizing uh, individual image data, you can do so by clicking on the images associated with these records and notice that this particular uh, mutant, actually um, the hyphae are quite reduced in, um, in, in branching and I actually can't quite see the canidia um, either. So you can explore this data further by essentially um, looking at um, different types of evidence provided, such as the cells um, were imaged on the edge of the um, agar, or you also have a whole plate images that demonstrate a uh, colony growth on solid media within the 24-hour uh, time limit. Note that this particular data set can be um, also exported by clicking on the download button, which means that you will be exporting all text associated with phenotypes presented on this data record page. And you can also click on data sets to learn more about the specific um, data set and explore the data set record page with additional um, uh, publication linked and a little bit more information about the uh, data set itself. So, but coming back to our search, we have a 55 genes that now I would like to transform into another organism, and this organism being Neurospora um, discreta. So, to transform um, the list of genes, we will choose the second option, and we'll be transforming it into orthologs in discreta. And I can identify discreta by quickly using the search bar at the top, and by um, Clicking round step, I will deploy the search. Notice that you have now 64 genes that match the criteria. It's actually a little bit more than you started with. You had 55 genes in the Rosper Crassa. And if we examine the um, gene table, gene results table at the bottom, you will notice that um, uh, we have a little bit more information to help you figure out as to why is it that you have isolated a little bit more um, uh, genes in count compared to Neurospora crassa, and it looks like if you look at the um, Neurospora crassa IDs that match discreta IDs here, some of them actually are matching to uh, several orthologs in discreta, and as such you have uh, parallel counts reported here. So that's one way um, how you can essentially mine the large genome uh, scale collections for phenotypes in one species and successfully transform them into um, useful information in other species. So um, now I would like to switch gears and show you another search using another um, phenotype in FungiDB. And again, I will navigate to uh, the phenotypic evidence search. And this time I will utilize two different data sets. One, is internally curated by UPathDB for Cryptococcus neoformin, neoformans, and then I'll combine the results with another data set that we have integrated from the pathogen host interaction database for five days. So let's go ahead and create our search in um, manually created, manually uh, curated Cryptococcus phenotypes first. So I'll click on the Create a Phenotype button and will uh, specify the criteria of my search. I will choose the reference genome H99. And in this particular case, I'm interested in looking for a decreased amount of virulence. Essentially, return any gene, whether it's knockout or mutation, that is linked to decreased virulence. So let's go ahead and click Enter. However, I also know that there's another five base data set that is um, also contains Cryptococcus data. So I want to be as inclusive as possible when um, searching this data. So I will go ahead and extend my search uh, strategy by clicking on the add step and actually um, bring in another phenotypic data set. So we are still looking for 
genes, so it will be combined with other genes option. And now I will quickly bring up phenotypic evidence window. And in this case, I will go ahead and select to search the Phi-Base um, curated evidence for Cryptococcus. When you click on the curated phenotypes button, the uh, search uh, options are expanded on, uh, on the bottom. So I will navigate to the pathogenic species on the left, and I'll use the uh, find items area to search for Cryptococcus neoformans. And um, as far as the mutant phenotype, I would like to look for anything that has a reduced virulence associated with its phenotype. And I'll go ahead and bounce that. So here we are. Uh, notice that um, I actually chose the incorrect operator. Currently, um, my strategy is uh, identifying genes that are present in um, that, that overlap, meaning that these 12 genes are present in Phi-Base phenoty uh, phenotype data set and also in Cryptococcus. But what I actually want to have all genes with a reduced virulence return on my search. So to do that, I will need to change the operator and choose the Boolean operator union. And I'll click revise to change the uh, search parameters. And here we are. Now I have 256 genes that um, have a um, defects and virulence when knocked out or mutated. So in the next step, I'm actually interested in learning how many of these genes are upregulated when cells are growing in, um, uh, in cerebrospinal fluid, uh, fluid, such as uh, conditions that are very close to um, um, what, that cells encounter during pathogenesis and tissue invasion. So I will go ahead and click that step. And in this particular case, I will take advantage of the RNA-seq data that is integrated in FarmGDB. So let's go ahead and search for the RNA-seq um, evidence, data sets. Click on the RNA-seq evidence menu, and uh, we should see a list of available data sets in this category. In this particular uh, option, I'll just go ahead and search for H99 data sets. And um, that will uh, sort of limit the list of data sets displayed that I can easily choose the data set that will fit my criteria. Uh, in this particular example, I would like to use the Cryptococcus neoformis transcript homes um, that were, uh, there were, uh, identified um, from the study on human meningitis where they have used cerebrospinal fluid um, grown cells. So I'll go ahead and click on fold change and actually look for the um, genes that are upregulated when um, let's say a HC1 strain is grown in vivo. So to do this, I will set up my uh, search to uh, look for upregulated genes only. And uh, subsequently, I will also um, identify or set up the search criteria. For my reference strain, uh, I will use HC1 strain that is grown in YPD. However, I will be looking for genes that are upregulated when cells are grown in vivo, such as HC1 in vivo over final, uh, spinal fluid and click run step. So here we are. Um, we have now identified that we have about 20, we have 24 genes that um, not only have a decreased virulence when they are mutated or deleted, but these genes also have a, a specific upregulation in expression when cells are growing um, in vivo. And if you look at the list of the genes that um, we um, are seeing, some of them are transporters, um, some of them transcription factors, some of them actually relate potentially to phosphate or um, iron metabolism, which is indicated that it could be a cell-specific response to growing um, within um, cerebrospinal fluids or um, tissue. In addition, uh, you can activate various columns um, in the uh, results table. And in my search, I have um, activated 
column to visualize the um, human meningitis. Let's see. Um, see one. I would like to activate actually the FPKM values for the um, HC1 strain grown in vivo. And so I can search for the APKM. Hmm. Well, I can't find it at the moment, <laughs> but I am sure it's, uh, it's just uh, search for AC1. Hmm, I'm not finding it, um, but let me let me check as um, I just ran the search and the columns were open. So th this is um, I, I probably not seeing it available on the on the list, but by clicking on the add columns, you can actually navigate to the and display the FPK graphs. The really great thing about having the visual representation is that now that you can also track not only the expression of particular genes return in our search in the HC1 strain, but also how this compares to a different strain that was used in the study. And perhaps look at the genes that may be differentially expressed, not only when grown uh, in vivo, but also between the two clinical um, isolate strains. All right, and before I, uh, before I um, give the uh, screen back to Amara, I just wanted to mention briefly that we, um, have several ways of how you can integrate the phenotypic data into um, QuantGDB, and that includes phenotypic data about anything about knockouts, about mutant um, uh, phenotypes identified in various conditions, such as corona in different media, et cetera. And there's several ways that you can integrate this data. First, you can submit the data by essentially creating a um, user comment. User comments can be uh, created when you navigate to an individual gene record page and essentially um, looking at the top of the page. Right now, I am on the Cryptococcus neoformans gene that has two comments. These comments are visualized within the user comments section. And once submitted, user comments become live uh, essentially immediately and they're always attached to your account so you can change or modify it at any time. To create a user comment, all you need to do click on the add a comment and then fill out a comment uh, comment form where you can uh, not only describe the phenotype, but you can upload uh, su support data such as images or Excel spreadsheets characterizing mutants, et cetera. For the large uh, scale uh, data sets, we also offer now a phenotype collection form. And I will post a few links in the chat um, in, in a second, but this one can be accessed, downloaded, and we actually offer a guidance of how you can report these phenotypes using various ontology if you choose, or just report the observation to us and our in-house curators will help you to integrate this type of data in the searches that I have just demonstrated to you. And finally, if you know of the large scale data, not just for phenotypes, for, but really for any type of data that you would like to see, in ViewPathDB, submit the data sets to us via the um, tool uh, in data set nomination form and um, let us know by providing a PubMed ID or a direct link to where the data set is um, uploaded to. All right, Amar, back to you. Thanks, Eve. Um, and also, I mean, uh, again, obviously there are lots of forms, lots of information, but uh, if you're in doubt, the best thing to do is uh, just send us a um, uh, a, a question uh, via the contact us link so on our websites uh, on any of our websites uh, you can click on the contact us link uh, eve is demoing it right now and uh, send us uh, questions comments uh, information about new data or simply questions on how to use uh, uh, various types of searches um, thank you eve so we're gonna uh, switch to uh, suzanne who's going to tell us a little bit about uh, subcellular localization whole genome subcellular localization uh, data sets and while uh, we're switching uh, the presenters and allowing Suzanne to set up, I just wanted to say that uh, it's pretty cool to see that different people joining uh, the webinar from all over the world. So obviously lots of people from North America and Europe, but I can see from the list uh, people joining from Mali, from Egypt, from Peru. I mean, this is a pretty, pretty nice thing to see uh, in these webinars. And this has been fairly regular on our webinars, so uh, it's exciting. Uh, and don't forget to ask questions in our question panel. So if you have any questions about what's being presented or you 
you have uh, a question about an extension to maybe something that's being presented, uh, feel free to ask uh, the question using the, the questions panel. All right, Suzanne, uh, go ahead. Okay, thanks. Um, I'm going to demonstrate two very useful data sets based on cellular localization imaging experiments. One is in Giardia assemblage A isolate WB, and the other is in Trypanosoma brucei 927 and represents the TRIPTAG project. Um, okay, I'll start with the Giardia one. So this data set comes from Scott Dawson's lab at UC Davis. And since many uh, Giardia proteins lack homology to proteins in other organisms, the Dawson lab set out to study uh, the cellular function by expressing GFP tag proteins and determining subcellular localization for about 400 genes. The, they're a proteomics lab and uh, so the genes that they chose were either highly expressed in trophozoite or they were part of the cytoskeleton of Giardia that they were already studying. So they, they you know, chose 400 genes, they expressed GFP tagged constructs in, in Giardia and they, then they did um, cellular localization imaging on this. So they end up with um, a set of images of GFP tagged proteins. And they didn't stop there. They called gene ontology terms for each protein. So their work becomes part of the annotations for the genes they studied. Um, and here's uh, just a little bit on gene ontology networks. They are cross species controlled vocabulary for describing the cellular location, biological process or molecular function of a gene. And Go terms are assigned to genes um, to help define their function, right? So uh, they can be assigned experimentally as in this uh, imaging experiment, or they can be inferred from orthologs. But of course, the problem that um, the Dawson lab was experiencing is that there was um, little homology to other organisms. So it was difficult to infer uh, you know, function and location from other, from other species. So the data that I'm talking about here is experimentally determined cellular location for 400 genes and called Go terms for each to improve uh, the annotation. Um, so we make this a data available on gene pages. So if you're drilling down into a gene's function, you can look at it there and you can ask the questions, what properties does my gene have? We also make a search to come from the perspective of, of um, the entire experiment so that you can ask the, the question, what genes in this experiment had products located in the nucleus or in the flagella, for example? Suzanne? So let's, yeah, yes. Sorry to interrupt. Uh, I think just to confirm, uh, somebody was asking that they only see the first uh, the slide, I think, that you're looking at right now, which is a Giardia trophozoid. Uh, and, and that's exactly right. I think you were on that slide for a bit, and now we're going to move to GRDDB. Uh, please let us know if for some reason you can't see uh, the GRDDB website uh, right now, and we will see if we can fix it. But I think it's working for most people. Thanks, Suzanne. Sorry for the interruption. Yeah, yeah. Sorry about that. Um, so I'm going to, I'm on the uh, homepage for GRDDB, and I, I hope everybody can see that. I'm going to go to a gene page to look at their. Um, to look at the cellular location imaging and I'm typing to get to a gene page I'm typing that into the site search box up here I'm going to click the magnifying glass and then use this card here to go to the gene page and notice that this gene page is a hypothetical protein so there's not much known about this gene and then I'll use um, this navigation pane to go to the localization image um, imaging data uh, and this, I use, so I use this pane to focus the data section of the gene page onto um, protein targeting and localization. And then we find a table of the cellular localization image um, results. And what this data produced was a GFP image and a um, differential interference contrast image for this. And then in the description, 
Um, so, so we provide these images, A, because it's a big part of the data, and B, because you can look at these and, and um, uh, you know, decide for yourself that um, you can examine it yourself and interrogate it to see if you um, agree with their, uh, their calls that this um, protein was expressed in the basal bodies, that possibly was in the um, cytoplasmic or anterior axonemes. Um, and if I scroll down, I find a list of GO terms, gene ontology terms. And what I notice here is that all of the gene ontology terms assigned to this hypothetical protein were assigned experimentally by the Dawson lab. And if I click on this, um, this column here, I am taken to uh, the gene ontology uh, record page for this for this term that they have assigned to the gene. And I can see that it's hierarchical. Um, so they've assigned the term of ciliary basal body based on their image, which is part of the cilium, which is part of the microtubule skeleton, um, which is cytoskeleton, which is part of the cytoskeleton also. So what we have is a hierarchical vocabulary describing the cellular location of this gene. And if I take this uh, go term and look, I, I can take this go term and look in other organisms for genes that have this go term assigned and, and relate my work to other or, organisms in that way. So that's what we have on, um, so, so the, the point of their um, assigning go terms to all of their images is that it imparts sort of an omics factor to this collection of images. Now you can relate it to other um, genes in other organisms. So that's what we have on the uh, gene page and I'd like to show you our search for that. So I'm going to go back to the home page and, um, and look for our search. I open up genes here um, based on protein targeting and localization. Here's the link to the um, search, cellular localization imaging. I go to the search page um, and I have three actually um, parameters that are defined, need to be defined by the search. The organism of course is assemblage A because that's the only organism that was studied. And then I can um, choose to search for individual GO terms, or to look at all genes with go terms using this wildcard search. So I think I'll go ahead and use this go term search to look for just one, and I'm gonna choose ciliary body, ciliary basal body, and get answer. And what I find is that I have 58 genes that uh, were tagged in this cellular imaging experiment with the term um, ciliary basal bottle body. And if I look down here at, at the results, I, um, you know, the first uh, column leads to the gene ID, and then I have, I'm gonna change this to five. Um, then I have uh, the GFP image close at hand, their description. I can click on add columns to add any type of data that I want um, that's associated with the gene, including RNA-seq or proteomics data. And I can also download this, um, these uh, genes and their associated data. So the power of this though, is that now we're in the strategy system and I can query other data besides just this um, cellular localization imaging. So I'll demo that here. I'm gonna click add step and um, intersect these ciliary body genes with a new search for um, expression. And we have this really great um, uh, RNA-seq experiment that determined the transcriptome of intestinal foci. So I'm gonna, use that search and look for genes that are highly expressed in intestinal foci. I click run step and I find, you know, close to 2000 genes that were um, expressed 
in intestinal foci, and 21 of those are actually located in the um, ciliary basal body. And then I have all of the functions available uh, again. Okay, so that's what I wanted to show you in the um, Giardia data, the trypanosome data. Let's go back to... Um, the, so this data comes from TRIPTAG study, and this was done by Sam Dean, Richard Wheeler, and Jack Sunter, and I might not have everybody, everybody there. I apologize if I don't. Um, and they noticed that about 4,000, um, there's still about 4,000 unannotated genes in TB927. So they set out to determine um, the localization for all TB927 genes. So they basically have expanded this experiment to a genomic scale. Um, of course, reality can be a bit more harsh than your dreams, and some dreams, some <laughs> some genes are harder to tag than others. They eventually ended up um, tagging about 4,900 proteins and characterized those uh, in applied GO terms. So they did N and C terminal tagging with MN green, and then did cellular local imaging with um, phase contrast, a Herx dye to get the nuclei, and then their um, fluorescence imaging. And we can look at that data on gene pages, um, and and we have a search available too. So, uh, So here we are at the gene page of a reasonably uh, gene page of a reasonably well characterized protein. That's a zinc finger. We know some things about it. We'll go to the cellular imaging data, and we see that we have the images here and their um, and the go terms that they have assigned to to this gene. We can click on this link to the trip trip tag data, and we're taken to their um, database of just their data with a little bit more information, their primer sequences, and they have these lovely overlay images here too, uh, which we um, have not integrated, were not available to us to integrate. Now this is a gene that, that was only able to tag on the N-terminal phase, although they, they attempted both. I'm gonna show you a gene uh, that was tagged um, both N and C terminal. And we have, you know, we have more images. We have images from the N and C terminal. And then if I scroll down on any of these pages, I see that I have my Go terms table and and we can see that not only do we have this, um, their cytoplasm call for this GO term, but we have other data, other um, GO terms that were assigned through orthology, um, which is always good to know. So let me demo just this one, one search. I'm gonna go up here to searches, look for um, localization, and I can go to the gene page this way. It's exactly the same search, even though we're in TriTripDB. Um, and I have two different, uh, you know, I have, I have three parameters. I'm gonna look for the C-terminal, um, C-terminal tagged genes for, and let's use the same, um, go term for ciliary basal body, and I click get answer. And I find that we have 150 genes that were called um, with this go term uh, that were tagged at the C terminus. Okay, uh, we know that some of those actually were um, tagged at the N terminus too. We could add that as a step to this um, to this strategy if we like. Let's do that. Um, but I fear I'm running out of time. Maybe I should, um, you know. Sure. Yeah. It's uh, we have 
20 more minutes, yeah. <laughs> no, I think this was very good. I think one thing that's uh, really important for people to recognize with any of these high throughput experiments, obviously there's gonna be a certain level of false positives and false negatives. And in particular with cellular localization, uh, you know, you are modifying a gene, you're adding a big tag to it and, and you're looking at where it's localizing. And so uh, there are many things that could affect the localization of a gene, right? So you may get a localization to the cilium, um, but in fact, that localization is artifactual because of, uh, of the fusion uh, protein. And so that's something yeah. to keep in mind. Um, also with the trip tag data, you'll notice as, as Suzanne indicated, they, they fused, they did both C-terminal and N-terminal fusion, fusions. Um, and then in many cases, you might get a situation where the C-terminal fusion has a different localization from the N-terminal fusion. And that's to be expected. You know, if a, if a gene uh, or a protein has a signal peptide for secretion and you tag it at the end terminus, so you're blocking that signal peptide, it's not going to be secreted anymore. It's going to probably be stuck in the ER or, uh, sorry, stuck in the cytoplasm or, or maybe mislocalized to somewhere else. So that's something that you have to keep in mind as well. So if a gene has a very well um, uh, uh, predicted uh, signal peptide or uh, some localization signal that's uh, has to be at the C or N terminus, then keep in mind what fusion you're looking at and, and confirm that, that you're not blocking that. And, and so that's very important to keep that in mind. Um, so let me go ahead um, and switch to me and I will continue uh, demoing uh, some, um, some phenotypic searches. So let me make myself the presenter. And, and again, obviously, um, uh, make sure you uh, ask questions in the question pane, and we will um, we will try and answer them as we as we come along. So um, I was looking, uh, you know, I was changing my presentation as I was seeing what both Eve and Suzanne were presenting. So I thought just to make it flow a bit better. So um, uh, Suzanne just showed us how you can find uh, a number of genes with C-terminal localization uh, based on the, the fusion protein. Uh, to the uh, basal body, I think. Uh, so I, I think I ran the similar search, but but that's basically what I did. Um, and so now what I'm going to demo is a, um, a second search, which is a phenotypic search that we have in TriTripDB, and that's called the RITSeq data from David Horn. And that data was uh, basically a whole genome uh, RNAi experiment. Um, and so they they essentially RNAi'd um, uh, every single gene. And uh, and if you're uh, uh, RNAi is uh, causing um, a decrease in fitness or, or lethality, then of course that the target of that RNAi will be missing from your population. And so the decrease in, um, in expression levels of a particular gene would indicate its loss from the population and uh, most likely indicate that it's involved in, in uh, fitness or, or uh, uh, it's, it's, it's basically essential between quotes. Um, and so I'm going to add a step here to this growing strategy, as is hopefully you're appreciating that this in silico experiment mechanism here to run your own search strategy is a really nice way to combine diverse data types um, and, and come up with, with um, new conclusions or develop new hypotheses that you then can go back to the lab and, and test them. And so I'm going to add a step here. And I'm interested again in intersecting my subcellular localization results with another experiment. And in this case, I'm interested in the phenotypic data. And in particular, I'm interested in this um, high throughput uh, phenotype RNAi target uh, uh, sequencing using target using RNAi target sequencing. Uh, and this data again is from David Horn's group. And so when I click on the the quantitative phenotype um, button right here, I get the search window. Again, it's um, there are different options here, so I'll recommend that you spend some time looking at this page, uh, but you'll notice that your choice here is for decrease in coverage, because again, the loss of your, your target uh, is, indicates that it, is, uh, it did not survive in the, in the growth assay. And so I can go ahead and select, uh, for example, the six-day uh, uh, bloodstream forms, um, and I'm looking for a decrease, uh, and then we can keep this at 1.5 fold and see what happens. Um, also, one thing to indicate before I go on, we do have, for many of our, our searches, we have a, a description here, so you can learn more about it. And if you scroll to the, all the way to the bottom, you'll see here that we have a link to the paper and also to our data set page, which will provide you even more information. So there is a lot of information on the, on the resource for you. Um, okay, so I'm gonna run the search. 
and let's see what happens. So uh, you'll see here that there were close to 4,000 genes that met the criteria that I selected in the, in the RNAi experiment, and 63 of them were also um, part of the subsector localization experiment, right? So now I know that there are 63 uh, genes that have evidence based on subsector localization uh, that localize to the basal body and are also potentially lethal or important or essential for, for survival. You can go back and modify any of these steps. So for example, if you remember, my uh, full change difference was 1.5, and maybe you want to change this to something more stringent. So I can go back and click on revise, and now I can say, well, instead of 1.5, let's change it to fivefold. Right? I'd, I've never run this experiment in, uh, specifically, so the result may be zero, but that's the nice thing about this is that you can run it and try it out and see what happens. So the result wasn't zero, so it ended up being 24. So now I have 24 genes that are uh, basally located, but also are, um, are you know, really sort of going down in expression and so likely to be quite important. And you can always go then, obviously, as Suzanne and others indicated, that you can just go in here and, and explore uh, the results table and uh, explore individual genes or explore the data itself in, in, in depth. For example, you can take a genome view and see where the genes are located on the chromosomes or you can analyze your results using various enrichment analyses. We have a number of uh, webinars that we've been running uh, over the last uh, couple of months, uh, including one on enrichment analyses. So definitely, um, I would recommend that you um, view that webinar uh, from our webinar page. Uh, so uh, and you'll, you'll, we had a lot of details there about uh, Go enrichments and how to do them. So I'm going to switch to uh, ToxoDB. And I'm going to run, uh, and, and staying with the theme of um, subsector localization, I'm going to um, uh, run a search for a sort of another type of experiment that tries to determine the localization of uh, proteins on a, on a whole genome scale. And this is an experiment that uh, came from uh, Russ Waller's group um, in, and, and the cool thing about this data, well, there are many, many cool things about this data. That it's, it's just a very nice experiment where they um, do fractionation, but then use a, uh, various computational models to uh, cluster proteins into uh, subcellular localization uh, or compartments. Um, and, uh, and so that's, that's pretty cool. Uh, the other cool thing about it is that the data was provided pre-publication uh, to the community. So this data actually is available now in a bioarchive, but even before it was in the bioarchive, it was available through ToxoDB to the community. So that's, that's very powerful. So um, again, I'm just gonna go under, um, oh, sorry, in this case, I'm looking at uh, localization. So I'm gonna, as, as I start typing in this filter here for the searches, you can see that there's a localization by Lopet mass spec. Uh, so now when I select this, you will see here that you get this uh, really sort of extended filtering mechanism where I can go in and say, let's say I'm interested in genes that are potentially in the apicoplast, right? So I can just start typing apicoplast, and you'll see here that there's some apical things, but then there's apicoplast probability as well. So I'm going to select this right now. And um, let's see, I'm getting some typing in the background. Maybe... Um, Sam, can you smooch yourself, please? Thank you. So um, as I type this, so I see apicoplast probability. Uh, and you'll notice here that there's uh, a, a scale here. And so things on the right hand of the scale are more probable to be in the apicoplast and down here are, are I guess, less probable. Uh, and you notice here the different methods, probability method. There's this MCMC and the MAP method. Uh, I'm not going to go through explaining them right now here. But if you scroll down, you will notice that there's a lot more information here. And the authors have their own uh, website, which provides even additional information. And so I would, I would uh, highly recommend that you um, visit that as well if you're interested in this data. But I'm interested in things that are potentially in the apicoplast. So I'm going to select um, everything that's above, let's say, around 0.8 or so. And immediately, you're getting a cue here of how many genes you're going to be returning. And you'll notice here that the 146 genes that are uh, localized, uh, potentially localized to the apicoplast based on this uh, experiment. And I'm going to go ahead and get answer. And so you'll notice all my previous uh, searches are available here. These, imagine these are all your little in silico experiments that you've been running. I ran this right before just to make sure everything is, is working. And, um, uh, but you can close these, obviously. So all of these can be closed. And if you log in, uh, if you 
If you did not attend uh, one of our previous webinars where we described this, if you log in, you can save these searches and share them with others uh, using these little icons up here. So it's a very nice way to uh, collaborate and interact with others. So there are 146 genes that are potentially localized to the apicoplast. Uh, you will get, uh, again, uh, your results here. And uh, in addition to um, uh, descriptive uh, columns, which show you the localization, there's also a graph, which is also available on the gene page. So every gene will have a section for localization, just like um, Suzanne and Eve showed you on gene pages. And uh, you will notice here that it gives you the different probability um, uh, algorithms and what the score was. And so for, for this particular gene here, which is a hypothetical protein, actually, which uh, this is pretty cool, right? This is a hypothetical protein that almost nothing is known about its function. Yet, from this experiment now, we know that it's most likely localized to the apicoplast. And so that's pretty cool. If you happen to be working on this gene, right, now you know something about this gene and you can actually take it further. And you'll notice here that many of them are, are hypothetical. Uh, here's a thyroidoxin domain protein, which is um, not surprising. Um, this PDHE2 is in the apicoplast. That's not surprising as well, and so forth. So that's, that's um, pretty cool, I think. Um, so I'm going to... Uh, again, in interest of time, let's see what I'll do here. So um, we have also another type of phenotype data that's available in, in ToxoDB, and that's an entire CRISPR, a whole genome CRISPR screen. Uh, so all genes in the genome were, were CRISPRed, and then the, the uh, growth of the parasites uh, were assayed and, and then assigned a fitness score, basically. Uh, this data was generated by Sebastian Laredo's uh, group, and uh, also provided pre-publication. Obviously, this has been published already, but when we, when we got it, it was pre-publication, which is quite exciting. So what I'm going to do is I'm gonna demo this data in, in two different ways. One is I'm gonna demo it right here. I'm gonna add a step, and I'm going to, again, intersect my uh, apicoplast genes, and I'm now gonna to go to phenotype, and as you start typing, you'll see the filtering here. I get CRISPR phenotype, I'm gonna select this, and it's a very simple search. It's, there's a, they have a scale of, uh, of scores. And um, again, you can read more about this in uh, the description here, but you'll see here the graph that describes the, the score. So things that are more to the negative are uh, more uh, important for fitness and, uh, or survival. And so you'll see here there's like more essential and then less essential. Again, that's a very, very subjective term, but that's the, the basically the way to interpret the data. Um, and so I can go in here and say, well, I'm interested in things that are essential, right? So let's go ahead and make this minus five. So I'm looking for any gene that fell in the minus five um, uh, to minus six range. So somewhere in this range of genes uh, from, my, from the CRISPR experiment. Um, and I'm intersecting these results with my apicoplast genes. So I'm curious how many of those apicoplast predict genes predicted to be localized to the apicoplast are also um, uh, essential. And so I got 363 genes that are um, important, you know, essential based on CRISPR, but none of these actually were any of these that are localized to the apicoplast based on this experiment. So you think, okay, well, I, this is terrible. It's not none of these, but remember, I changed, I, my, my fit phenotype score was minus five right, right here. So that's, that's pretty stringent. So maybe I, you know, maybe I need to reduce this. So let's take this back down to minus two and see what the results are. And so as you revise this, you can you can look and see and again that it's it's again zero and so we're getting very frustrated right and you're thinking well what's going on here why am I getting no results this is actually this is not possible so one thing that's really important to think about when you're when you're um, running these searches is to ask well what organism was this uh, experiment done on right and so this if I go back to my hyperlopid experiment you'll notice that all the genes that are returned are me forty nine genes. Toxoplasma ME49, uh, that's a strain of toxoplasma, if you don't work on toxoplasma. And if I click on the CRISPR experiment, you'll notice that they're all in TGGT1, so it's a different strain. So no wonder I'm getting zero results between these two. So now you're kind of stuck here thinking, well, what am I going to do? I really want to know which ones of my genes are, are lethal, which one of my apocryphal genes are lethal based on the CRISPR data. And so the solution we have for you is to leverage orthology. And so I can take these CRISPR genes that are in TGGT1 and convert them to the orthologs in ME49 and ask the same question. And instead of having to rerun this experiment, I can click on edit here 
and I can select orthologs from this um, option up here. And now I can basically select uh, ME49 from my list. I'm just going to transform my GT1 uh, to ME49, and I'm going to run this step. And let's see what happens. We'll give it a few seconds. And while this is running, I'm going to look at the question panel and see if there are any questions so far that need answering. I think they're being answered. Okay, good. They're all answered. Um, so as you'll see here, now there's uh, out of my, uh, you know, so there were orthologs of my uh, MB49, GT1 genes in MB49. And now you'll notice that 108 of my genes are also in the subcellular localization uh, experiment. Okay, so uh, you know if you can take anything out of this uh, point here is that leveraging orthology it's incredibly useful for for really going across across species uh, across the strains in this case, but you can use it across species, which I will I will show you in a second. Uh, and if you're if you're interested in orthology, uh, we have our webinar next week is all about orthology. So we're going to talk about how we determine orthology in ViewPathDB resources, and also how you can use orthology, uh, leverage orthology to not only transform between different strains or species, but also to define the phylogenetic pattern of the the genes of interest. For example, you may be interested in genes that are conserved in Plasmodium but do not have any orthologs in uh, mammals or arthropods, for example. And you can actually run this search using uh, the orthology profiles that we have, and that'll all be covered in our webinar um, next week. And again, if you are, uh, can't find where our webinars are, you can go to help, learn how to use UPathDB, and we have a webinar page that you can explore further by clicking on explore, and you'll notice here that the one next week is on orthology searches. So I would highly recommend that you uh, join that webinar and learn more about it. Okay, so um, let's see. I'm going to jump quickly and to um, view PathDB. Okay, and I'm just going to show you the results of the search. I'm not going to run it. It's basically you run it exactly as you run it in uh, in ToxoDB or PlasmoDB. So I ran the CRISPR search, which was on Toxoplasma GT1 genes, just like we ran it in ToxoDB a few seconds ago. And then I transform by orthology to all organisms in in ViewPathDB, and you will this this actually takes takes a little bit to run, so I'm glad I pre-ran this. And as you scroll down here, you'll see that I got 100,000 orthologs, or almost 101, 110, or yeah, 101 thousand ortho, orthologs, and uh, across all species in ViewPathDB. So that's everything from vectors to fungi to other apicomplexa. They're all there. And now you can start, you know, you can ask questions. Well, if it's lethal or if it's essential in uh, toxoplasma, maybe it's also essential in plasmodium. So I'm going to go down here and I'm going to find uh, plasmodium falciparum 3D7. And here it is. There are 256 genes that are orthologs of these. I'm going to select these and apply filter. And now you'll notice that my results will be filtered to the 256 genes from plasmodium falciparum 3D7. These are uh, orthologs of the toxoplasma essential genes based on the CRISPR experiment, right? So based using orthology, you can make some broad assumptions that, well, if it's lethal in toxoplasma, maybe it's also uh, essential in, in plasmodium. So I know we're reaching the top of the hour, and there were a couple of uh, assays that I wanted to show you in PlasmoDB. So I'm just going to quickly show them to you, just so you're aware of them. So again, if you click on phenotype, you can, uh, if you search, uh, if you filter your searches based on phenotype, you'll see that there's a phenotype evidence search available to you here. And if I select this, you'll notice that there are a number of different types of experiments available to you in PlasmoDB to uh, examine uh, uh, phenotype, uh, phenotypes in PlasmoDB, including essentiality. One is the uh, data coming from the PlasmoGem project. This is from, um, from uh, uh, Oliver Bilker's group and um, uh, and others are listed here, and you can get more information about uh, any of these studies by mousing over this, and it takes you a, to um, a link to the um, to the publication as well. Uh, and so I can ask for uh, things that are uh, based on uh, data available in Plasmogem. Um, I can also get data based on the RMGM DB uh, or database. This is from Chris Jensen's group, and there, this is a um, curated phenotypic uh, database, just like um, uh, the, the uh, Phi-based data that um, uh, Eve was demoing to you in uh, fungi. Um, 
We also have a, uh, a piggyback insertion mutagenesis data set. That's in Plasmodium falciparum from John Adams' group. And so this is similar, I guess, to the CRISPR data in when, where you can go in and ask for genes based on their fitness score. Um, again, they, they transmutagenized all genes and then looked at the fitness of the, the progeny. And so all of these have similar types of searches. So if I click on the first one, for example, you, get, uh, you can select a phenotype or I can, for example, select the relative growth of the of the um, uh, relative growth rate and again if you want to really learn more about this you can scroll down and go to the paper which has a nice description of what they mean by relative growth i can select by clicking and highlighting i can select things that are are have this particular relative growth and you'll see here that you're going to get 1200 genes what's really cool about this type of filtering search is that i can go back to the phenotype uh, list here and you'll notice here that there's now some of these bars are red indicating how many of the ones I selected here are also um, uh, uh, are also um, categorized under these phenotype options. And so in this case, I can see that uh, most of them are essential, and which makes sense because I selected things that have a really poor relative growth rate. Okay, so, um, and that's how you'd run the search. And again, clicking on get answer, will start a search strategy with the results of the genes that are um, essential based on the plasma gem data. I know we're at the top of the hour, so I'm not going to spend uh, any more time demoing searches. I think you get the idea. If any of these searches are uh, interesting to you and you want to learn more about them, uh, please um, feel free to uh, email us um, and, um, uh, and and let us know. Uh, and let us, uh, just give us your questions. Uh, I'm going to now look at the question section and see if there are any questions. Um, any of my moderators, are there any uh, co-moderators, are there any other questions that we should answer? I think we got them all. Good, so as I'm waiting, I'm going to pop this thing up here. So if you've joined the webinar late and you did not uh, respond to this uh, survey, feel free to do so. Um, I will uh, put the link in the chat box again. Uh, and so you can feel free to do that. Um, Just okay, note, then, as, as always, if, if you have any questions after the webinar, feel free to contact us. And then uh, the other thing that I wanted to point out is that we do have a post-webinar survey, which I will also post a link in the chat. Um, and, you know, definitely go ahead and scan this right now or click on the link right now. We'll send it to you tomorrow as well. But uh, again, I think I mentioned this on every webinar, if you don't click on it now and start answering it, it's very short. It'll take you like two minutes to answer the entire survey. We just want to, you know, get your feedback on uh, open-ended questions on, on, you know, what is your, um, uh, what, what do you feel like in terms of what other webinars you want to learn, uh, you, wanna, uh, you want us to conduct. And so that's really useful to us, uh, of course, to know how we're doing, if, if we can improve these webinars. So, um, definitely uh, go to this uh, survey and start filling it up. Uh, and as I mentioned, it's, it's very quick. Okay, I'm uh, looking at the questions to see if anything else come, came in. I think all the questions were answered offline. Great. Well, if that's it, thanks uh, Eve and Suzanne for your help and thanks uh, other moderators for answering questions offline. And uh, if uh, uh, there's nothing else, then thanks again for joining this webinar and uh, see you soon. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.